come today at a time like this with our hearts overflowing. They overflow with sorrow because we lost a loved one, family member, friend. And it creates a certain sorrow in our hearts. Our hearts are also, they overflow with compassion because we hurt for those who are hurting. Often wishes something we could, like a magic word or some magic pill that we could give someone to take away the, the pain, but it doesn't happen that way, but our hearts overflow with compassion. But also, today, our hearts overflow with joy. It may seem odd to say at a funeral, but Angie knew the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior. Can I tell you, Angie is whole. And she's healed. And that should bring us a certain joy, a certain comfort. There's no pain. There's no sorrow. There's no suffering. I'd like to read a, some scriptures to you. Just To me, I find these scriptures comforting, and maybe you will as well. Some of my favorite scripture is found in John, in the book of John. And, and in John chapter 14, here's what Jesus is saying. Now, it's interesting because Jesus is not, he's almost at the end of his life. He's, he knows in a few days the cross is where he's going. And he's trying to convey this to his apostles. They, they can't really understand this, but he also he knows that when this happens, there's going to be a lot of sorrow. And so he begins trying to prepare them. And he says this in John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, I love what he says next. If it were not so, I would have told you. If this, if this isn't true, I would have told you this isn't true. But I'm telling you, I came from there. I'm giving you firsthand testimony. There's a place called heaven. And those who know Christ as Savior, there are mansions prepared. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Now Thomas speaks up, and he says this, Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And then Jesus says this next, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. That's in John 14. In Psalms 23, we read these verses. Often verses read at a time like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Notice the personal relationship the Lord's talking about. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I would say to you, Ron, as much as your heart hurts. Christ is there. And he offers a comfort that no one else can offer. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And this is similar to what John had told his apostles. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beautiful verses. Give me a speed of few more places. I'll go back to the book of John, John chapter 11. And in John chapter 11, in verse 25, Jesus said to her, and this is a story about him raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said to him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And one more place I would like to read to you in 1 Corinthians 15. 
And in 1 Corinthians, Paul is speaking to this Corinthian church, and they are going through some, some confusion, some difficult times. And he's trying to encourage them. He's trying to encourage them about this concept of death. And what does it mean in the life of a believer? Because Jesus said, you believe in me, you'll never die. But yet we know physical, di physical death is a part of this. But Jesus is talking about the spiritual life. And Paul now teaches a little bit more about that in 1 Corinthians 15. In verse number 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And that's a nice way of saying about dying. We shall not all die. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall I put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So the Bible explains to us that even for the believer, when death comes, that there's still life. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I would tell you this afternoon that Angie is alive. She's alive in the presence of the Lord. That which death can take has taken, and that is the, the mortal body. But death could not take her soul. That was saved and preserved by the Lord himself. And she's now entered into her rest. Now she has looked upon the face of Jesus and is rejoicing. That should bring us comfort. I hope it does. Let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing as we get ready to go a little bit further into the, into the service. Father, we would ask now for your help. You know our human condition. <clears throat> you know, even though we have great promises in the word of God, Lord, we still sorrow. We sorrow because we love. And unfortunately, Lord, that seems just to be the consequence of love, that grief comes in. Lord, so we grieve, we hurt. But yet, Lord, we know that there, even in the grief and the sorrow, there's hope. Because we know that Angie is safe. She's secure. She's healed. We thank you for that. Thank you for that confidence. But Father, on this side, we still sorrow. On this side, there's still hearts that hurt. So Lord, we need your help. We need your presence. We need your closeness to us. Lord, I pray you be close to the family. Be close to the friends that are gathered here, the fellow church members. Lord, be with us. Move, speak, draw us close to yourself. And we ask for these things in Christ's name. Amen. Before I go further, often at a time like this, there are those who would like to say a few words by way of testimony or maybe something, some reflection. And that can be a big help in times of grief. And I don't want to be negligent if you came prepared or even now are thinking about wanting to say a few words in a in honor and memory of Angie, so I'd be happy to open the floor, and if you wanted to say something, uh, you can come up here, and, and if you had a few words you, you'd want to say, is there anyone who would want to do that? All right, then I'll continue then. Wait. Okay. Mrs. Chilton. I did not come prepared, but I didn't want to do that with not saying something about Angie. Hi, Ron. I saw Angie for the first time in our church, and I said, hmm, who's this with Ron? I need to find out if he'd met Angie and married her. We were so <coughs> delighted, and uh, 
my first impressions were lovely lady, very well groomed. And I thought, wow, Ron, <laughs> you've really married up here. <laughs> so, <laughs> with all due respect, Ron, we did not you. <laughs> so winding the clock forward, my, the second standout tall aspect of Angie was her incredible willingness to learn. Um, she came into a church that she was unfamiliar with. Everything about that church was unfamiliar. And so the second standout quality was that we embraced her in the church family. But she wanted to know more about Jesus. And I came up to her one Sunday night and I asked her, do you know Jesus, Angie? Are you able to know? 100% sure that if you were to die today that you would be in heaven. Do you know Jesus? She said, no, I can't answer that question. Well, of course, I knew the right thing to do for somebody that loves the Lord is to share that message with her. So I sat with Angie and I went through some scripture with her. And she was just like laser listening. Like a laser, she listened to the message, the gospel message. And then she bowed her head and she trusted Christ as her saviour. It was the sweetest night. So we know Angie is with the Lord because the Bible said so. And really those were the two things I remember about Angie. And she was just a precious, precious friend and sister and wife. And that's what I remember about Angie. So I'm sorry, Ron. I did not come prepared, but I couldn't let you go, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I'm just going to read a poem. This is from her sister. Um, it's called In Loving Memory of a Dear Sister. My dearest darling sister, how can I find the words to say to tell you of how I miss you throughout every single day? I miss our little chats, the way you'd listen to me moan, and how you'd always cheer me up whenever you would phone. Living life without you is so very hard to bear, and I give all I have to awaken and to see you standing there. Thank you. Anyone else want to say a few words? When I come to a time like this, I don't have a standard, <coughs> generic funeral message where it's just a bunch of words with blanks and you kind of fill in the blanks of people in the time. Each life is unique and different. And therefore, I think each funeral message should be unique and different because it honors that life. It reminds us of that life. And I typically, when I'm trying to develop up something to say at a time like this, my starting point is a prayer that it's kind of like this, Lord, what verse best exemplifies or best uh, illustrates or best describes, pertains to the life of the, of the one we're going to be talking about? And so when Ron called me that Monday morning, it was, it was obviously a phone call. As a preacher, when your phone rings 4 o'clock in the morning, it's seldom a, a good phone call. And I grieved with them. I, I was in shock. And I made my way to the apartment, and I think I was about five or so, something like that. And then we, we talked, we prayed, we cried. And we went to the hospital and picked up Angie's stuff and then made our way back. And so I'm going to guess it was 8, 30, 9 o'clock when I got home, something like that. And Ron had asked me to do, the, the, uh, to do this, the funeral service, and I began praying, saying, Lord, what... What specifically? What verse? What, where should I go to? And it happens often this way. Almost immediately, the Lord brings my attention to a certain passage or a certain verse. And that's what happened. I said, Lord, what should I say? Where should I go to? How can I be a help and a blessing? And immediately, Psalms 32 just jumped out at me. In my, in my mind, my, my memory, I, I started thinking about those verses and was drawn to it. And so I'm going to go to Psalms 32, and I'm, 
I want to share three things I think that pertains to the life of Angie that hopefully will be a, a help and encouragement to you. Three things I'll mention, and then I'll kind of read the psalm with, that talks about that. First thing I want to talk about just for a few minutes is Angie's greatest blessing. In Psalms 32, in verse number 1, it says this, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I, not, have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. In my conversations with Angie at church, and a few times when we visited the apartment, Angie always wanted to tell me of some blessing. Typically, if it was a Sunday, she wanted to tell me some blessing of that week. Something that the Lord had, uh, she had read, something that the Lord had done, something that had happened, some blessing. She always had something that she wanted to tell me about. And I think Angie was very thoughtful, very cognizant of things that occurred, things that happened, and, and she saw the Lord in those things. And often she would talk about the blessing of, of Ron, her family, her friends, Maybe someone at church. But the greatest blessing in my conversations with Angie, the greatest blessing that Angie ever spoke about was when she talked about having her entire sin account washed clean by the blood of Jesus. She'd often go back to it and just talk about how that she was so glad that someone had told her about Christ could save her and how her, all of her sins could be washed away. I thought about that when I, when I read these verses. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. As we think about blessings, sometimes, when we think about the Lord's blessings upon us, sometimes Jesus blesses us by doing for us what someone else could do, but they won't do. For whatever reason, they, they, they don't. And we find ourselves at a loss. Maybe, uh, maybe we're pained, hurting, and we find like that no one is there to help us or no one is there to encourage us, and the Lord comes along. And that's in Psalms 142. David talked about that. He said this in Psalms 142. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, with my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed him before in my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path, and the way wherein I walked, had they privily laid a snare for me. He's talking about all of this issues he's going through life, and the troubles of life, and the, and the problems of life. Then he makes this statement, I looked on my right hand, and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. And then he says this in the next verse, I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. So sometimes the greatest blessings of God, as we think about our life, some of the great blessings of God, is when the Lord does things for us that maybe someone else could have done. They could have encouraged us. They could have helped us, but they don't. And the Lord comes along and helps us and encourages it. And we say, Lord, thank you for doing that. But that's not his greatest blessing. God's greatest blessing in, in any life is when he does for us what no one else could do, even if they wanted to do it. And that's what he did for Angie. I'm sure there's people here who love Angie, who would try to do anything they could for her. But there's one thing you could not do for her, that Jesus did. And that is to save her soul. To wash away her sins. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Maybe someone sitting here would say, oh, I would have died for her. That may be so, but you couldn't have saved her. Only Christ's death could save her. And that's what Christ did. And that is what always thought Angie talked about at church, and she was thankful for. Now, Deborah had mentioned this, and this is true at first. When Angie first came in our church, because it was interesting, because Ron called me and, and said, guess what, I got married. <laughs> I was like, you did? Uh, Good, congratulations. 
And I'm, I'm, I'm going to, and we're, we're coming this Sunday. Good. And so the first time I met Angie, and uh, she, you know, she was never been in our church. We're all strangers to her, and you know, there's a certain distance there. And you know, I'd preach, and you could kind of see a little puzzlement on her face, not really putting two and two together, not really understanding where we're coming from. But as she heard the gospel and she began trying to process what that means, her big hurdle, which is true for many people, was she kept saying, what do I have to do? Well, how do I earn this? How do I get this? How do I get this salvation? And then one day it clicked. And you could see the light came on. It's not something you earn. It's a free gift. I just have to accept it. And I remember when she made that decision. And then followed in believer's baptism and then was faithful to our church. And boy, you can see the light that came on and the Lord began working her heart. She began growing. Now I'll say this and I hope that you understand the, my meaning when I say this. She didn't become perfect. She became forgiven. And that changed. That changed her. You can see it. it all of a sudden the light came on. Christ was in her. And I would tell you this morning, Angie's greatest blessing was knowing Christ as Savior. I have complete confidence standing here that Angie is looking upon the face of the Savior. Not because she came to our church, not because she did good things, but because she put her faith in Christ alone. That was her greatest blessing. And then as I thought about this psalm, I thought about the second thing, not only her greatest blessing, but Angie's current condition. In Psalms 32 again, in verse number 8, it says this, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be not as a horse or as a mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near to thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Now watch this last verse. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy all ye that are upright in heart. Angie loved being in church, and Angie loved learning about Jesus. Angie sat right up front. So if this is my pulpit, she sat right over here, uh, and Ron sat beside her, and uh, uh, she was, when she was there, she was always in front, had her notebook out. If it was a Sunday school lesson, if it was a, a midweek Bible study, she was filling in the blanks. Uh, even during the sermon, she'd be taking notes. She was, she was zeroed in. There's a PowerPoint. She was watching it, listening, writing things down. She loved to learn. She was growing. It was, it was a blessing to her. Now, watch what I'm going to ask. Do you think she's any different now? I don't. You know what I think? I think if there's any time that Jesus is speaking, she's right up front. And she's taking notes. And I don't know if Jesus uses PowerPoint or not, but if he does, she's, she's into it. She's right now, every, everything, every blank, she's filling it in. It's interesting. Sometimes she couldn't be there because of health and things. I, I, as a pastor, I find this funny. Ron would come early before the service start, get the worksheet, and take it back to Angie so Angie could have the worksheet so when she was watching online, she could have a worksheet to fill in. That's how eager she was to learn. That, that's really an amazing thing. And I think in heaven right now, could you imagine listening to Jesus firsthand? So that's her current condition. I think right now, Angie is enjoying all that there is in heaven. And watch this. But she's not in a wheelchair. She's not in pain. She's not suffering. Angie is enjoying time with her Savior. No pain, no sickness, no discomfort, no suffering, no distress. And I tell you, based on Psalms 32, she's glad, she's rejoicing, and she's even shouting for joy. We sorrow, but we don't really sorrow for Angie. Angie's having the time of her life. Angie's happy. She's glad. She's rejoicing. We may hurt for each other, but we rejoice with Angie. So that's Angie's greatest blessing. That's Angie's current condition. And then there's one other thing I saw in Psalms 32 that reminded me of Angie. And that was in verse 6 and 7. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. 
Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. So the third thing I would share this morning is Angie's heart desire. There are three things which are true about heaven. Those in heaven do not want to return here. Why would you? Why would you want to leave a place of perfection and come to a place that is very far from perfection? Those in heaven do not want to return here. The second thing we know about heaven is this, that those in heaven want you to be there with them. No one in heaven is like, oh, no, don't, don't bring them. People in heaven are like, no, I want them here. They want their loved ones there. They want their friends there with them. So those in heaven do not want to return to live here. That's pretty clear. Those in heaven want you to be there with them. And then the third thing about heaven we understand is this. And this I say uh, with a heavy heart. Not everyone who dies goes to heaven. We read that verse earlier, John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Maybe the saddest thing there is is that those who teach in any other way than Jesus Christ, because there is no other way to heaven other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way. So I would tell you, at this moment, if Angie could express one desire right now, if she could just speak one thing, she'd say, I want you to be in heaven, and I want you to trust Christ, because he's the only way. Her heart's desire at this moment is for you to trust Christ as your Savior, so you can be in heaven with her. Would she want to come back here? No. I had a friend who lived in Hawaii, and then he moved back to Cleveland. <laughs> And I said, why would anyone in Hawaii move to Cleveland? Are you crazy? He said, well, you know, family. I said, okay, I understand that. But I can't imagine anyone leaving heaven and coming back here. But those in heaven want us there. And they know that the only way there is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the, the simple truth of the matter is this, that anyone can have the same free gift that Angie had. But you've got to do it the way that Angie did it. As Deborah explained, she, she basically, Angie prayed a simple prayer like this. I don't know the exact words, the exact, I can't quote them exactly what she said, but it was something like this. This is typically a prayer. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please come to my heart and wash away my sins. And I trust you and you alone as my Savior. And typically we say something like, help me to live for you, help me to follow you. Now, when Angie prayed a prayer like that, and she opened her heart and received a free gift of salvation, she guaranteed herself a home in heaven. She didn't know when that would be, but I'm glad that she did it. Because I can stand up here this morning and tell you, this afternoon and tell you, <coughs> Angie's in heaven. She's doing great. We rejoice with her, even though we sorrow with each other, we rejoice with her. And hopefully that will bring some joy to our heart. You bow your heads and let's close in a word of prayer. Now, Father, we do come to you again. And we're thankful for the word of God. We're thankful for the gospel. We're thankful for the free gift of salvation. Lord, I'm glad Angie heard that message it could have been at a different church and in different circumstances as long as it was the gospel but it happened to be at our church and in those circumstances so Lord we're thankful that we had a, at least a small part Lord I'm thankful that she called upon you as a savior and I'm thankful that she's rejoicing in the, by walking those streets of gold that mansion that was prepared for her. I'm thankful, Lord, there's a place where there's no <laughs> suffering, no heartache. There's only joy and gladness in the sight of Christ. Lord, we're thankful for it. 
But Father, also, we would have to say, Lord, we still need your help. We need your grace. We need your, your closeness, Lord. Because as much as we rejoice with Angie, we still sorrow in our own hearts. Ron has lost a wife. There's been a lost daughter, sister, aunt, niece, friend. There's an emptiness, Lord. But we ask that you'd fill it with grace. Fill it, Lord, with your very presence. If there's someone here this afternoon, Lord, who does not know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that they would open their hearts and call upon you and trust you and you alone as their own Savior like Angie did. And that should help us, Lord. Even beyond the service, even as we go through the day, through the weeks, months, years that follow, I pray that you continue to comfort us. Now we ask for these things in Christ's name.